I think we're going to go ahead and get started. We're running a little late already, and I was told my only job here is just to keep us on time, so I want to try to stick to that very important job. My name is Stacia Bowden. I'm Associate General Counsel with Wichita State University, and I'm excited to be here today. We have an amazing list of uh, participants, speakers, and uh, round table, round ta table, excuse me, round table folks who are going to come up here um, and going to present to you uh, about opportunity zones and um, why that means so much more than all the maps you're surrounded by here in the room. Uh, so welcome. Thank you for taking the time to come here today. We all, uh, all of us who are vested in this, see all of you here today as a very important part of making um, the most out of these opportunity zones. To get started, I want to welcome um, uh, Jeff Longwell, Mayor Jeff Longwell, to the podium. Well, thank you, and uh, what a great group. It's, it's really nice to see everyone here. Obviously, really important discussion we're going to have. I will tell you that we truly are at um, an unprecedented and crucial time period in our future, and, and so it's really nice to see so many faces. I know we have a number of, of area elected officials. Um, not sure that you all checked in. I, I know that I've seen many Vice Mayor Blue Balls here, uh, Council Member Becky Tuttle's here, Council Member Clay Combs here. Um, I think I saw Senator Oletha Falskado walk in. Did I, did I miss some others? If you would stand up, we'll recognize you. Um, Representative Finney, thank you. Great to have you here too. And um, Councilmember Johnson, I didn't mention you, did I? You're going to be speaking. So of course you would have been recognized. But uh, th thank you all. And did I miss anyone besides Councilmember Johnson? I'll say his name three times. Because he, um, he's excited to be a part of this. I know you've been um, a part of many of the discussions already. So thank you. And I know we have some past elected officials here. And so thank you all for coming. Certainly want to share that the time to act is now, that Opportunity Zones present a unique and, and equitable, beneficial opportunity for us, for investors and for the community. So we have neighborhoods right now that are ripe for investments. The Opportunity Zones are a chance to raise up these economically depressed communities and present a higher quality of life to those living in them and adjacent to them. And to our investors, you won't be able to find a more lucrative return on your investment. I'm not a financial advisor, but I play one occasionally. Great return on your investment. Like many of our city projects, we can't be complacent anymore. The time to act boldly is now. And so we want to thank everyone for being here. And we appreciate your, um, obviously, concern about acting boldly in, in this opportunity. I did see one more elected come in. Councilmember Fry joined us late as usual, but he joined us. No, he's fine. So working together to make our city the best it can be is critically important. So thank you all. Appreciate, look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Mayor, I was really hoping you were going to talk longer because I strategically rearranged the agenda. Um, to keep us on track, I just want to give a couple of minutes devoted to Opportunity Zones. Um, when I was asked to moderate, one of the first questions I had was, who's the audience? What level are we at here? And it was explained to me that what we all will get to participate in today is more than a Intro 101 course. Um, this is a much more um, in-depth discussion in terms of getting down a little bit further into some of the opportunities that are out there. It's not meant to be a, if you've never heard of an opportunity zone or you're not sure what it is, you're in the, probably in the wrong room or you might have to play a little catch up uh, as we go through some of these things. Impressively, we have eight federal agencies represented here today. Um, we have the EDA, and of course, somebody speak up if I get any of this wrong. EDA, EPA, HUD, FDIC, SBA, HHS, and the uh, FTA. 
And if I've said any of those acronyms, probably for those of you, uh, you can also correct me if I'm wrong. What you see here on the boards in the back and on the screens um, are the highlights to the Opportunity Zones. I was very excited to come here and represent Wichita State University today as the moderator. Um, and it was intentional, I'm not going to be at the table as the moderator is because we actually as a university are in an Opportunity Zone. Um, we are also um, actively engaged in developing what used to be a very um, um, we're very grateful for having that golf course as long as we did, um, but we are engaged in our deep into developing that old golf course into what we call the innovation campus. Um, we are also very active in securing and at least pursuing grant and other funding opportunities um, that were part of the um, 2017 um, Tax Act where um, that gave us all um, really the kickoff to these Opportunity Zone um, initiatives and incentives. Um, but enough about us. Uh, what our um, panelists and our presenters are going to talk to you today a little bit is um, where you can tap into or where we can all tap into some of these incentives and initiatives. Um, I think that probably the one that has received the most attention um, here recently has been the um, tax incentives, which are extremely important and are a very um, integral part of the um, incentive programs. Um, that's the preferential treatment for the capital gains invested in these uh, low-income opportunity areas. Um, there are also other, as I mentioned, initiatives and incentives and um, a lot of our federal agencies as well as I don't want to leave off our um, state and city entities as well. We also have here today, we have the Greater Wichita Partnership. Um, we have the um, Downtown Wichita, and we have, of course, um, the City of Wichita and the Wichita Community Foundation. Um, we also have the South Central Kansas Economic Development District here as well. Did I leave any agencies, departments, or groups off? No, okay. Um, so everyone's going to talk to you, and I, and I don't want to get into too much of what they're going to speak about here today. They're going to go over an overview of some of those things. Um, but I do think that one of the things that we can all think about as we're sitting here is what role do you play, what role can you play, um, and where are the gaps? Um, are they funding gaps that you haven't thought of, that we haven't thought of? Are there collaboration opportunities in what maybe we can join forces? There is plenty of opportunity out there um, for everyone. And frankly, are there some areas um, that we haven't focused on or haven't thought about that are available out there um, that might be um, an opportunity in the waiting? So without further ado, um, I am a couple of minutes ahead now. I want to go ahead and kick off our first um, discussion here today, and that is going to be with the City of Wichita and Partnership Opportunity Zone presentation. Um, we will, I would ask that the um, city officials and the economic development partners who are ready to speak on that area, go ahead and come on up. Well, good afternoon, everybody. We're so excited for uh, all of you to visit this great city of Wichita. We're grateful for our friends at the federal level and state level to visit uh, our great city. We're seeing tremendous growth uh, in across the city, but particularly we want to talk about the opportunities within, the, within our opportunity zones. We have obviously one in the downtown that's seen tremendous uh, development. Jason Gregory from the Downtown Partnership will talk a little bit briefly about that. Just in the last 10 years, we've seen three quarters of a billion dollars worth of new development in downtown. Uh, but one of the things we want to talk about is how do we spread that activity and interest into other parts of our city, oftentimes that are overlooked. And so as a city, we've looked at a multi-prong effort to bring interest and activity into these different areas. And there's five areas that we want to focus on. 
And I'm going to say these are not everything and all things. This is where we're starting. We hope as we go through this process over the coming years, this may further broaden as we work, work with our existing city departments and our partners, other opportunities, other avenues of success will come forward. But those include our housing. We have a new housing director, Sally Stang, who, who recently came from Tucson, who's brought some new great ideas for us. We're going to talk a little about transit and what we can do to move transit to transportation, about a whole system-wide effort to, to move people uh, across this great city. Uh, we'll talk about planning and zoning, some of the recent activities the city has done to initiate changing the mindset about how we as a region and as a city and county look about development, particularly with infill development and urban development. We're going to talk about curb appeal, which is infrastructure. We often talked about how, as a city, do we expect our, our residents and citizens and our investors to make improvements if we're not doing that ourselves to create that curb appeal, because we all know location is so critical. And lastly, we're going to talk about additional resources we're going to bring to the table as a city to focus on economic development within these opportunity zones. So first off, housing. One of the things we find with a lot of incentives, not just within this great city, city of Wichita, but across the city, is many incentives are focused on large new developments. And one of the areas that uh, we have seen tremendous interest within our downtown is facade improvements. How do we clean up the skins of our buildings? But one of the challenges that we have with the state law it says if you do facades, they have to be buildings that absolutely front on right away. So the challenge we often find with some of our older areas is where they'll have buildings set back from the, from the roads. That limits our opportunities to do facade improvements. So working with our housing development, we've put in a $50,000 grant opportunity to leverage uh, housing dollars to improve uh, small businesses' opportunities within our opportunity zones. Additionally, we have uh, set aside $100,000 in, in our programs for also infrastructure projects to do sidewalks, pathways, crosswalks, streets, and drainage. Then lastly, and these are annual allocations that we're going to continue to explore uh, furthering. I, I will note some of these pictures you'll see here. I purposely have not chosen Wichita pictures simply from the fact I don't want somebody to say, well, that's my house or that's my corner. So these are nondescript. Uh, one of our, our key upcoming projects, and Sally can talk about this as we go on the Q&A, is our rental assistance demonstration project. Again, this is the idea is, is as much as we ask our residents and our investors to keep their properties up and keep them up to speed, up to code, we need to do that within our own facilities. And so we have embarked on this rental assistance demonstration, which will essentially allow the city to invest north of $50 million to improve all of our public housing units, our 500 plus housing units. That includes single family to duplexes to high rises, I guess maybe Wichita we call mid rises. Um, that's an opportunity for us to give a fresh facelift to the community. Uh, so hopefully our neighbors uh, in the private sector will see that and continue to, to, to drive activity on their end. One of the new ideas Sally is bringing to the table is an opportunity to permit the city to use project based vouchers for new construction or substantial rehab affordable housing projects. And one of the interesting things that Sally will talk about later is the opportunity to have that, that resource so investors can look at that. How do I have a dedicated return on my investment? And it's an opportunity to say, we're going to focus on project-based vouchers or Section 8 vouchers. That becomes a unique revenue stream that may cause new investments with some of these uh, opportunity zones. Transit, I put this picture up there. The mayor sent this to me because this is when the last time we rode a bus. But uh, uh, the thing I put up here was so interesting is, is this is the pictures in the 50s, uh, is look how everybody dresses. These are business people coming to and from work. This was their mode of traffic or activity. And you know we got away from that across the whole US. We went to car-based system. And there needs to be a return uh, for people who want to use cars, people who want to use transit people to create a transportation system. What do we want to use uh, our 1,000 scooters that we have out there starting as of today, or our bike share, or you want to get on, I think we have motorized scooters or skateboards discussion a couple months ago, or people simply want to get out and move about the community. And how do we make that work? I grew up in the Washington, D.C. area, and we have this great transit system called Metro. And I just thought everybody got up and got on a bus or a subway, and that was how we got around until I moved out of D.C. and thought, oh, okay, this is how the rest of the world seems to move. And the car was so focused. But how do we return that? 
how do we make transit or transportation system work for all people? And in, in one of the effort, our transit group is moving away from the hub and spoke to a grid system. And the purpose is to move away from the car focus, but how do we focus on greater multimodal designs and services? So where you live, work, and play, you have an opportunity to travel. One of the interesting things, we'll be quickly moving here at the start of the year into new electric uh, buses. Uh, one of the criticisms of people who ride buses is the noise. Hey, I want to talk to my friends, or I want to do work, or I want to talk on the phone, and you have that diesel or whatever, that loud, not, loud sound. Hey, I want to get on my device, I want Wi-Fi, an opportunity to have that capability that that bus now provides a platform for you to either communicate with others or communicate with work, extending that opportunity to be in constant communication. So we're excited about that opportunity. The other part of that I just want to back up for a second is one of the things we work with WSU and WSU Tech is how do we train those people that maybe are underemployed? How do they have an opportunity to excel in employment? And one of the things we're finding is great, we, we train and we educate them, and then they go back to their home, and the problem is how do I now get them from their home to their employment? And again, that's back to instead of a hub and spoke system for transportation, it's more of a grid system. How do I move them from North Wichita to maybe to South Wichita where or Spirit, or Textron, or Bombardier, or Cox, or Cargill, or Coke, need them to be employed. And the challenge is now, the obstacle is not education, but transportation. If we can solve that travel, or that challenge, we have an opportunity to employ, or greater employ our people within the community. <laughs> Planning zoning, there's been a lot of talk about how do we move away from that car focus? How do we uh, effectuate uh, infill or urban development? And recently, the city, uh, approve the Places for People plan, the city and county approve this, and this will set apart a new process over the next 12 to 18 months to look at all of our aspects, whether it's zoning, whether it's transportation, whether it's infrastructure, whether it's how do we communicate with one another, how do we pedestrianly, pedestrian, that's not even a word, I just made that up, that's, a, that's great, that'll be, in, uh, that'll be in the dictionary next year. So how do we move people uh, in a positive way that they have more integration with other, everybody? And this, this was not an end-all plan that was adopted. It was really a starting point. And that's where we need continual community input. Over the next 12 to 18 months, we're going to be embarking on some ambitious goals. Uh, just for example, these are some of the targets. Uh, within one, you know, every year, it improved 25 miles of road annually with enhancements for pedestrians, cyclists, and transit users. We t if we take that target on, that means as we go as a city or county working together is how do we utilize our capital improvement plan to say, are we meeting that target? Where is that target? How do we deploy that resources? You know, one of the things is how do we create 350 net new housing units within that central uh, core of the city? If you think of 350 uh, new units and an average of two to three people a within each unit, that's between 700 and 900 new people bringing into our central core which also means we may not have to move them as far as distances between their live, work, and play opportunities. But that's going to take strategic discussions. How do we encourage that infill development? We know oftentimes infill or brownfield development brings unique challenges. It may be an old gas station. It may be an old laundromat. It may be whatever it was before. It may be a vacant lot, but then they find out that when they start getting, digging it up that there's foundations there. One of the things we've heard, for example, is as we've had new developers come in, who want to do new affordable housing, they find the cost of removing those old structures and taking it to a landfill is often the barrier. As they look at their margins for success, that $10,000 cost, for example, to, to remove and dispose of that is significantly impacting their bottom line. It causes them to think, do I move forward with this project? Are there ways that we can work with them? Perhaps there's a discussion about landfill tipping fees that say, if you're going to develop in these certain areas and you're having to remove and demolish certain things, there's a benefit for that. Is there a, a, a benefit for additional sustainability you build into your development? If you're going to build using solar or other renewable energies, do we consider additional uh, development or density uh, advantages to that? Those are the things we've got to look at as a community to be successful. Just some of the strategies. Again, I don't want to go through all those, but every time as we look at new projects or as we consider new standards for projects, we want to look at these are the strategies to employ. Again, I'll go back to the curb appeal. How many of us, as we drive through some of our older areas of town, 
we wonder why don't we see people walking or why don't we see people who have ADA concerns it's because they're challenged with our, our streets and our curbs or drainage. How do we get that investor, whether it be you or others, to consider that corner or that place on that street if we have drainage problems, if we have um, uh, sidewalk problems? I didn't put up a picture up here, but I can't remember it was. I was in the city driving through there. It was a nice sidewalk. Down the sidewalk, there were uh, telephone poles in the middle of the sidewalk. How does that work to be a real uh, transportation opportunity? So we want, again, as a city, look at our capital improvement program. Where do we deploy resources to be effective? If we can create that curb appeal, it may cost somebody to think more about that property that, hey, I can make a project worthwhile because I have a great curb appeal. Then lastly, we know uh, just to continue to do what we do with our existing resources are challenging. And part of that is because we're seeing great success in other parts of the city that consume time and effort. The city has decided and committed that we'll be hi hi hiring a FUSE fellow to work specifically and solely on developing an economic development plan within our opportunity zones as well as our other uh, low-income distressed areas. That person will have a challenge to work with all of these different partners, Urban League, United Way, WSU, Power CDC, among others, and they will also continue to invite other stakeholders to be part of that discussion. And part of their responsibility over the first year is to conduct and create a roadmap for the community to how do we approach development in these specific areas. Do we have certain outcomes that we want to see? Just because John Q walks through the door and says, I want to do a project, are there certain metrics that we say, John Q, we'd love to have your investment, but here's the standard we're expecting to see in your development. You'll see some of the first year outcomes, a community needs assessment, a stakeholder uh, economic development action plan, working on a community benefit agreement that how all our partners say these are the expected outcomes for any particular development. And the key one, you see the last one is begin making deals. As much as we talk and create new plans and ideas, the key is at the end of the day to get new investment working. And part of this is we want to partner with our partners, and one of our key partners is Jason Gregory with our downtown partnership. We'll talk specifically about how we market opportunity zones, not just locally, but externally to bring new interest to our area. Jason? Great, thanks, Scott. Uh, interest of time, I'm going to go quickly, but each one of you should have uh, an opportunity zone prospectus. Um, as has been mentioned, so there's a lot of people that are they're playing a whole bunch of different roles from federal to state to local uh, government agencies, um, our economic development entities, but also the on the ground people are commercial real estate brokers, the attorneys, the accountants. Um, all of us have got to work together on this if we're going to be successful in actually uh, gaining some traction with this program. Um, one of the things we're doing, where's the, this is the answer? So the, the primary target for this is an external audience. So how do we make sure that national and regional investors know about Wichita? Because if you think about it, every city in the United States also has these opportunity zone tracks that were identified. And there are fund managers on the coast. There are regional investors who are looking uh, for, for these opportunity areas. and so. Making sure that we, we communicate the, the opportunities we have is, is what we feel our primary role is. Um, we wanted to make this as simple uh, for somebody that knows nothing about Wichita as an introduction to Wichita. So there were nine census tracts identified. We, we broke those down, the contiguous ones, into to five zone areas. And then within each one of those, and I'll go quickly through, through uh, we, we identified what we felt like were the top opportunities for either redevelopment or new development in those areas. And so uh, the, the first zone, it was obviously covering downtown Wichita. Um, tremendous investment that we've seen to date. Um, as he mentioned, over three quarters of a billion, uh, nearly a billion if you go back a decade. Um, we, we continue to see major investment, uh, the new ball field, uh, the, the investment along the riverfront. There's a tremendous opportunity in the greater downtown area. And then, again, if, if you know nothing about Wichita and you're, you're taking a look at our community for the first time, what are those high-level areas that will introduce somebody uh, to, our, to our areas? So 
uh, just walking through this, each one of you have this in the zone two, South Wichita, the just, city just completed the South Central Broadway uh, corridor study and plan um, that's been uh, adopted and identifies that as well as a commerce arts district that falls within this zone area. Southeast Wichita, we feel like the, the Clap golf course, the decision was made to, uh, to, that will no longer be a golf course, but there is uh, potential for park and green space and or potential redevelopment opportunities in and around that. Um, so the area there, it's obviously a, a medical concentration for our community too, and it's identified um, in the plan. Zone four, uh, Northeast Wichita, which includes Wichita State, the neighborhood surrounding that. And then lastly, uh, Zone 5, which is North Wichita, the Dunbar Theater, McAdams, there's been tremendous uh, efforts already underway, and we feel there's, there's um, opportunity there for, for additional investment. But So what are we doing to market this? Um, that's one of the main things I wanted to touch on. So this, this document was mailed to over uh, 150 site selectors, national site selectors. We also uh, partnered with uh, uh, our local uh, accounting firms, attorneys, we identified over 300 major opportunity fund managers that have already created uh, funds across the United States that are looking for these types of investment areas. They were each mailed one of these. We've since uh, followed up via email personally, and we've gotten traction. We're also doing a lot of online marketing around this. We've applied for and we believe we will be granted uh, Google AdWords. Uh, it's up to $1,000 a month um, of free Google advertising. So if somebody searches Opportunity Zones, Wichita, Kansas will rise to the top of those searches. Um, we're doing LinkedIn, uh, targeted, targeted um, advertising. So members on LinkedIn that have skills that include wealth management, real estate, wealth advisors, those types of uh, skill sets will see Wichita, Kansas. And when they get on their LinkedIn account, we'll be, have the opportunity to there. We're doing various display advertising through business news sites, so fiscal and economic, investment banking and real estate, venture capital. Those targeted uh, industries will see Wichita, Kansas. And so we're putting about uh, $12,000 through the end, end of the month in, in, in advertising. We intend to do that, but we're really doing a, a major push now because everybody else in the United States is doing this as well. And so we want, to be, we want to be noticed and recognized. So then our role is really to harness this outside investment and then channel it to our local partners. So we've, we've talked to folks who will call us and say, hey, we're, we're hospitality investors or we're uh, low-income housing uh, developers and connecting them with the neighborhood leaders and or uh, those, those individuals on the ground here uh, that can make the most difference. Um, Again, I know we'll have the opportunity to get uh, into some more of the nuts and bolts. I wanted to just tell you some of the things that we're doing versus the, the, the nuts and bolts of the program. Figure we can, we can discuss that in greater detail. Councilmember Johnson, I'll introduce you to, to make the uh, final thoughts. Thank you, Jason. So I will definitely be brief. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for being here. Greatly excited about uh, this work and what the future holds for Opportunity Zones. But I just wanted to highlight a few things. One, you heard that our downtown is definitely growing. Nearly a billion dollars has been spent downtown. It's thriving, it's gonna continue to thrive, and has great public and private partnerships, but our neighborhoods need help. And this legislation was put together to help out our neighborhoods. And oftentimes our neighborhoods see these wonderful things happening downtown, but they wonder, when it's gonna to come to them. We see divestment in our neighborhoods. Many of the zones that you saw, there are people leaving those neighborhoods and businesses closing their doors. We have not seen the same interest from many in the development community outside of a Habitat or a Mennonite or a Power CDC to build those affordable housing units. And it's something that our communities need. We have buildings that sit empty and this is an opportunity to change that, but we're gonna to have to really push for changing that because our neighborhoods need it. The way our neighborhoods improve is with this investment and empowering other people financially to help build their neighborhoods. So our quality of life here in Wichita is, is wonderful right now, but it's more than entertainment. 
It's more than restaurants. It's more than scooters. It's about where those scooters take you, where you lay your head at night, where you wake up in the morning, and we have to be focused on improving those areas. So when we think about the Dunbar McAdams area, it's the theater, but it's also the home surrounding the theater. When we think about Fairmount, it's those historical homes that need investment. It's some of those homes that need rehabbed so that we can see an increase in home ownership. Because in lower income areas, we see more renters than homeowners. So we need those single family units in South Broadway, the same thing in the Schweider neighborhood, in Hilltop, and even around the Clapp Memorial Park, and the homes in the Ballpark Village. Those areas need help. And it is my hope that we all can collaborate and be intentional about focusing on those neighborhoods as well as the exciting uh, downtown area. And it's been tough around this country as I've talked to my colleagues about that to get neighborhood investment, but that is key. The return on investment might not be as much, but it's what's necessary for a successful city. So with that, I wanna leave you with a quote by the authors of this bill, both Democrat and Republican, Senator Scott, Booker, Tiberi, and Kind. Too many American communities have been left behind by widening geographic disparities and increasingly uneven economic growth. We come from different parties and regions, but share the common conviction that all Americans should have access to economic opportunity, regardless of their zip code. The Investing in Opportunity Act will unlock new private investment for communities where millions of Americans face the crisis of closing business, lack of access to capital, and declining entrepreneurship. American ingenuity has never failed us, and with this bill, we will dramatically expand the resources to restore economic opportunity, job growth, and prosperity for those who need it most. Those four senators said that, and I hope that we continue to honor that word and focus on our neighborhoods that need us so, uh, so much. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, very informative. Now we want to hear from some of our state presenters um, about some state programs um, that we can benefit from in these opportunity zones. Good afternoon. I'm Patty Clark. I serve as Deputy Secretary for the Kansas Department of Commerce, which is the lead economic development agency for the state of Kansas. Scott, thank you for the invitation to join you this afternoon. We appreciate it. Um, the Kelly administration is very committed to knitting together the resources of the agency and the state with local efforts to maximize the designation of opportunity zones, whether it's the census tracts here in Wichita or the census tracts in Wichita County. Um, there's 74 census tracts that have been designated in um, 41 communities, 34 counties across the state. Each of those has an opportunity to draw in that much needed capital um, to invest and create places to live, work, and play um, and improve the quality of life for the residents in those census tracts, in those communities, in the, in the state of Kansas. Really, commerce is playing two roles as um, a partner in opportunity zones. One is to help knit together creatively and nimbly, and I know the words creatively and nimbly don't often come to mind when you think about state programs, but to do that, knitting those resources and programs and assets together, working shoulder to shoulder with communities to grow the opportunity zones and attract that investment. And our second role is really to help communities market. Um, you talked about the prospectus, um, and I'll get back to that in just a minute. But I think what we need to do is beyond thinking of the normal business incentives that the Department of Commerce offers to recruit and retain businesses and companies in Kansas, think a little more broadly, think a little more creatively in terms of the quality of life tools that commerce and other state agencies have that can be knitted into this effort and integrated into your proposals. And I'm gonna give you a few examples. 
Kansas is now reestablishing the Kansas Main Street program, which was abolished in 2012. Um, that's going to bring a whole new set of tools, whether it's the downtown area of Wichita or the downtown area of Russell in terms of historic renovation and economic development and downtown uh, revitalization. So it's a program that we need to look at as we begin to really invest and, and design these opportunity zones to maximize that outside investment. Another one is the Community Service Tax Credit Program. And people kind of go, uh, what? Um, this is a tax credit program that is provided to uh, nonprofit foundations and to communities to help with housing projects, working with interfaith housing and Habitat for Humanity, where tax credits can be brought and, and prioritized into the opportunity zones in our cities to, to, again, maximize that investment and draw it in. And there's no reason we can't prioritize them in that way. Um, another one that popped into my head just as I was listening to the presentations by the city, Brandon, yours especially, um, home ownership. Commerce manages what is called the individual development accounts, which is a tax credit program to, that is created for individuals and families to build up savings. Um, it's, it's donors match individual contributions to a savings account. And one of the purposes for that savings account is home ownership. So just remembering that all those programs need to be integrated into this effort in each of those census tract. And I think when I think of commerce's role in that regard, I think about us as kind of the knitting needles. There's all these threads out there that need to come together to make that afghan or that sweater or whatever. Um, and, and we're the knitting needles to make sure that communities and opportunity zones are not missing um, one of the threads that they can bring to the creation um, and funding for opportunity zones. I do want to visit just briefly on the prospectus website that is going to be pulled together by Commerce to help communities reach those global investors that are out there. Working with this website and with our site consultants that are in New York, the Great Lake region, East Coast and West Coast and Southwest part of the United States, we can market not just Wichita, but the state and all of the 74 opportunity zones to a, a larger global reach. And we want to work with each of you. Each community will have its own page to tell its story about what those investors can achieve by investing in these census tracts and in these metropolitan and rural communities. And um, I believe that is going to be, that website's going to be open and live sometime this fall. And we look forward to working with the city of Wichita um, in terms of the contributions you're going to make to that website. So I want to leave you with that thought that don't overlook some smaller program because it, on the surface, doesn't seem to fit. Let's at least explore that together before we say, no, it doesn't work. And that's what Commerce and our staff are here to help you do. Pick up the phone, send us an email, let us help you figure out ways to use those resources that don't normally pop into your head when you think about a project such as this. I'm going to apologize in advance that I have to leave. I've had a bit of a family emergency. So Amy Selm from our uh, Kansas Department of Commerce Business Development staff is going to take my place on the panel. But just know that we're here as a partner. Um, as I said, not only to the city of Wichita, but to all the other communities and counties. We want to draw all of the investment we can into the state and, and um, showcase Kansas as the place to live, work, and play, not only in the Midwest, but in the United States as a whole. And thank you again for the invitation, Scott. We appreciate the opportunity to be here. OK, 
Okay, we're going to move into some questions and answers. And Amy, did you want to come up here? Um, we have a couple of microphones here in the middle. And um, so that everybody can hear your questions, I'd ask that you come up to the microphones. And I, as we're kind of getting seated up here a little bit and comfortable, um, I'd like to get a sense of who all we have here. If, um, if you would associate yourself as um, involved in real estate, whether you're a broker or maybe you're an investor um, or a financer, raise your hand. Okay. Um, if you consider yourself maybe representative of an agency or an organization who is looking to um, for some grants or um, funding mechanisms to help your your cause or organization, raise your hand. Okay. Um, what about um, community members in those in the communities that we're talking about? Do we have any folks here that fit that? that bill, wanting to know more about what's going on in these zones that you live in or work in. Um, and um, how many of you are business owners in these areas and, and came today for more information? And some of you might have raised your hand. And then how many of you are uh, state, local, city, federal agencies and entities? Okay. If you noticed all the hands that went up last time, then um, for all of those that are here to learn more, I hope you also take the opportunity to, to network. Um, if you do nothing else, take a name, take a phone number, um, find out who is here giving these, this information today because they are the experts in this area and they are here because they want to help you and others and you never know what a connection today can make for your project or your interest tomorrow. So now that we have the round table, which is rectangular and long in size. Um, does anybody have any questions? Great. And if you're comfortable, please state your name or who you represent. Good afternoon, State Senator Mayor Jeff Longwell, thank you. City Council Member Johnson, thank you so much for this. This is wonderful. Serving on the Senate Commerce Committee and just uh, working with our new Secretary of Commerce Opportunity Zones. Uh, most of the uh, uh, neighborhoods and addresses I saw were in my district, so, so this is a good thing. Um, my question particularly is related to uh, the transit system. Uh, today I had a meeting out at um, near uh, Oliver and Pani in Wichita uh, with our new Secretary of DCF. And one of the questions that came up in that meeting was how do we get transit there more than one time a day? Um, and to connect those out south, I've also heard, heard from uh, military members who are located here at McConnell Air Force Base who don't have vehicles yet and they want to come into the downtown area more. Um, how can you elaborate a little bit more on uh, the logistics of that and how you plan to um, expand our transit system? Thank you so much. And these microphones do come out too if you want to take them out, pass them down. I'm sure this is on. Okay. So, a couple of things that uh, were mentioned, we are trying to change our transit system from a hub and spoke to more of a grid system. That certainly will change things. You know, when initially we talked about scooters coming in this city, the scooters, uh, the thought behind it, would they, they could be, uh, in addition to public transportation, first and last mile, uh, I think we're seeing them more as entertainment, but, but maybe that will change eventually. And then at some point in time, when we talk about extending transit to some of our neighboring areas, it's going to take a change in uh, the, the foundation of transit. Because right now, it's city property only, with some exception of parking rights, where we're running some routes to our city now. Uh, we don't ride buses to Mays, which neighbors us. We, we technically can't run out to the Colin Air Force Base, it's not in the city. So because of our charter on the transit, uh, it's 
limited to the city proper, and at some point in time that's going to change. But our new transit director, Mike Tan, is trying to come up with some innovative ways of, of uh, changing the way that we look at transit. Maybe it will take uh, some private cars. One of the success stories that I like to remind people is the Q line that uh, was mentioned because of the electronic or electric buses that are coming in. So the Q line, before we expanded the hours and, and the route itself, was only um, averaging about 4,000 riders a year. The first year that we expanded uh, the hours and the length of the Q line, we had over 120,000 riders. And, and that was done in a public-private partnership, and so we may be able to do more of that as we look at some opportunities for transit. But the other thing that we know is that we, and everything happens exponentially, as we continue to fix transit in small ways, it will eventually help our federal funding, because federal funding is based on the amount of travelers and the, and the miles that they ride with us. So the success the queue lines have will help us with our federal funding. Thank you. I think one of the, I think one of the things that I'm going to add is, and sometimes it's overlooked, is the new partnership with some of our educational districts that are working with the city uh, transit system to allow our youth to use the buses to get to and from home to school or to summer employment. Uh, it's one of those where I would say starting young, getting them to have a positive view about transit. I think as they get older, they'll continue to have those positive views, especially as we upgrade our, our bus system, the buses itself, we have Wi-Fi those opportunities that become a viable platform for more and more people to consider this option. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Gail Finney. I'm a state representative for the 84th District. And my question is kind of twofold. I'd like to start off by asking about opportunity zones. Uh, and one I was curious is if the city of Wichita had input in designing the locations of the nine districts. And I was wondering, because before I thought that they had shifted a little bit, they were, the areas were a little bit different prior years. And the other question I was wondering, uh, someone that has experience of working at the chain, a minority business development and a business owner, one of the problems that we run into in our neighborhood is always getting the information last and not having it at a timely manner. So I was just curious as to is the marketing and making sure that different neighborhoods get the information out. But today it's a good crowd, but we're also missing a lot of people that can benefit from this program. So I was wondering if any of you can answer either of those questions. So to give any anybody else have any questions, these are great questions. Um, to give Sally an opportunity to talk, um, Sally, you came from Tucson, correct? You're actually new to this job, but not to the area, right? Uh, Midwest. To the area and to the oh, to the area and to the job. Okay, <laughs> great. 
Um, as director of housing services for the city of Wichita, do you, um, what do you see as um, maybe some low-hanging fruit uh, for the city and for our potential partners in some of these areas? Well, as we identified in, in the PowerPoint presentation, you know, the forward thinking and creating the consolidated plan and putting you know, $50,000 aside for the facade program is very low hanging fruit. Um, our plan was just approved by the HUD office last week, and we're working with staff on, on developing that program and putting it out for uh, solicitation. In addition, the, you know, we making sure that we have funds available, CDBG funds for infrastructure, uh, targeting those to the to the opportunity zones provides, it can provide just that a little bit extra that a project really needs to get off the ground. Um, the focus on affordable housing, affordable housing has to be all types of affordable housing. It needs to be affordable rentals, renters, affordable home ownership. We need to be exploring um, other avenues, continuing to work with our uh, development housing organizations and the development of more affordable housing in all areas but definitely a focus in these targeted areas. Great, thank you.
So again, that person is fully employed for at least that minimum first year with this sole purpose. The purpose they won't be diverted to other activities. And if I can add on to that, the, the fuse fellow is someone who is either, uh, well, they're, they're experts, um, but they either have retired or are still in the field and looking for a new challenge. So they come with a lot of experience. Uh, and their goal when they get here uh, is, as Scott said, to get out into the community, engage the community, also look at all the plans we have, which talks we've had a lot of plans sitting on shelves to see what those look like, engage our neighborhood associations, our small businesses, our organizations, and then see how we can all work together, bring all those efforts together and improve our communities. But this person is typically a professional who has been in the field for several decades or so, looking for that new challenge. And um, I forget the percentage, I might get it wrong, but I say at least half of them tend to stay in the city that they can go to. So we're hoping that Wichita is also that place that they call home after their first year and they want to continue to stay and work on those challenges. But that's who the Fuse Fellow is. Uh, we should be doing some interviews pretty soon, tomorrow actually. Um, and then that Fuse Fellow will be here once we uh, make that decision sometime in September to get started with community engagement and learning about uh, more about Wichita. Thank you. I think we have time for one more quick question. Um, Carla Jackson Patton. I am the president of the Power Neighborhood Association, which is um, I-135 on the west, uh, the west side of Broadway, 21st to 17th. Three border, um, Zone 4, which is Northeast Wichita, and the main focus is Wichita State University. Um, this area just bordering WSU um, is an economic free depressed area. And um, my question is, how do we become enfranchised within and what opportunities are offered to this neighborhood and this community as far as the opportunity? So thank you for that question. Um, so the unfortunate part are these actual zones are not permanent. And this came really quick. So the law passed, things were moving quick, all the regulations and specs were not done on it. Some of them are still uh, coming out. Um, but at this point, uh, Governor Collier had a certain amount that he could choose. So not every one I submitted was big, but I'm sure that happened around the state. Um, and those are now final. What can happen for power neighborhood associations working with the development that may happen in zone four, as well as other things going on purpose built communities and we figure out those borders in that neighborhood will probably be in that and how we can work together so we can address those um, issues in the neighborhood, whether it's affordable housing, multi-family units, whatever that might be, you all will definitely be a part of that conversation. Um, and the Fuse Fellow will also be reaching out and one of their things is going to be making sure they are knowledgeable of all of our neighborhoods, neighborhood associations and those communities. Because that's the only way we can put together a uh, real plan. But uh, again, unfortunately, that is set in stone unless Congress changes it. I don't know if that's going to happen anytime soon. Uh, I know a lot of folks are trying to see how successful this will be and if there's any tweaks that need to be made. So I can see Congress tweaking before allowing new um, zones in there. So unfortunately, it was pretty quick for those zones to permit at this point. And if I could add that last question too. So, so there's no way we can touch every small business in City of Wichita, obviously. That, that, there's no way we can do that. But one of the things that we're doing strategically to try to ensure that, that everybody has uh, information is we've had several roundtables with smaller targeted groups of accountants, your attorneys, the banking community. Nearly every small business has some interaction with, with those professionals and making sure that they're well versed on the program. They're going to know the ins and outs of your business. You're going to have those conversations with your accountants if you're looking for expansion or that's an opportunity, they need to be very well educated in this program. They need to be introducing those opportunities to you as a small business owner. Um, we, we work with, with companies as large as 10 employees and companies as large as 5,000. So, so it, it really doesn't matter. And I think that's one of the, the primary benefits of this program is that it's scalable. It's not, you know, you don't have to be the 5,000 company uh, employer in order to take advantage of it. And so I think one of the ways that we can interject in these neighborhoods and see smaller, either two, five person businesses that are looking for an opportunity is to make sure that they know about it. And, and those are two ways we're doing it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay, thank you. Um, I want to try to stick to time, so if you could save your question till the end. I, we have another round table of discussion, if that's all right. I want to um, thank all of the uh, round table attendees here at the table. Thank you so very much. Originally, we did have in the agenda a short break, but we did take that out knowing we probably would be moving through a lot of information, a lot of people quickly. If you need a break, please feel free to step out, but we're going to keep uh, trudging forward and we're going to welcome our federal partners and talk a little bit about our federal programs in the Opportunity Zone. We didn't talk about order, uh, but if the federal um, representatives wanted to come forward. And maybe we will start with, um, if it's okay with you, the um, housing of um, the, yeah, um, HUD, housing of urban development. Let's see, we have Bruce Ladd and Jeff Carnes, is that correct? Jason Moore, sorry. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you, uh, Stacia. Please hold your applause for afterwards. Um, I want to thank the uh, city and, and the state for helping uh, put all this together along with my staff. So I would have a chance to bring the federal partners here and showcase how we can uh, target our programs and our grants uh, towards the Opportunity Zones. Really, the point of, our, um, of the White House Opportunity Revitalization Council is to work together in a collaborative manner so we can do a little bit of our own housekeeping and uh, look at our own programs and our own regulations, uh, red tape that can often slow up projects, which I know is kind of hard to believe. Um, but for us to come together and help drive economic growth, create new opportunities, and, um, and revitalize these uh, neighborhoods that have uh, kind of long been forgotten. As a council, we want to also work with our elected officials to uh, make sure that policies are put in place that aren't uh, eventually displacing people, that Opportunity Zones were meant to uh, um, help. Also, uh, we want to work with our private investors, make sure that their projects are also in line with our federal investments, and to work with the community at large and to make sure that um, the community stays engaged uh, along with the city, as well as uh, the 13 federal agencies that make up the council. We want to streamline our grant processes and make sure that our programs uh, overlap and complement each other to make uh, Opportunity Zones a success. So I'll kind of take my hat off uh, from the council and kind of just talk about HUD's programs and how HUD's programs can come together and uh, uh, make this a success. And I, and I know some of you guys are taking a break, um, but if you can kind of keep your voices down so we can kind of present us, I'd appreciate it. Thanks. Um, so under HUD's umbrella, we have several different programs. We have multifamily, we have, um, we have single family, we have uh, public and Indian housing, we have FHA, plus many, many others, which I won't go into since I only have 10 minutes to speak, so um, I'll just talk about some of those that I had mentioned. And through FHA, and our, we have multifamily uh, mortgage insurance, which you can use to refinance uh, apartment complexes or apartment projects, both existing and new projects. We also have uh, um, dedicated underwriters um, that will just be dealing with our mortgage uh, applications in Opportunity Zones to make sure that those are uh, processed uh, expeditious, ex expeditiously and effectively. Um, we also have, uh, we have lowered our uh, mortgage uh, insurance application rates. 
um, as well as we want to help develop multifamily loans that help develop affordable housing in our opportunity zones. Our uh, community planning and development office I know works with the city quite closely in working with their community action plan. <coughs> um, our community development block grant program is probably our most flexible program uh, that you can use for many different um, to create resources to uh, provide economic development um, across the city. Uh, right now the city gets approximately $2.8 million in community development block grants. Also our section 108 loan guarantee program is where you can uh, borrow uh, against your community development block grant money. You can borrow five times uh, the amount of what that uh, loan is. You can also use the section 108 program for housing rehabilitation, public facilities, and large uh, physical scale um, redevelopment. You can also do uh, site redevelopment um, if you want to help attract uh, investors to that uh, opportunity zone. Uh, we also, uh, our neighborhood revitalization strategy area, uh, this is a way to target our community development block grant resources to support our community revitalization re, uh, efforts for stimulating the investment of uh, human and economic capital by economically empowering our low income residents. Our home investment partnership program, which is referred to as HOME, provides formula grants to our states and localities uh, that communities can use, often in uh, partnership with local nonprofit groups to help fund a wide range of activities, including building, buying, and rehabilitating affordable housing for rent and home ownership. Um, this, I know the city over the last several years has received our home money and has used that for housing rehabilitation and down payment assistance. And I won't go into all the other different projects because it's kind of preaching to the choir, but um, our housing trust fund, it's an affordable uh, housing production program that complements existing federal, state, and local efforts to in increase and preserve the supply of affordable housing. Our emergency solutions grant is a program that provides funding to engage homeless individuals and families that are living on the streets uh, to help and improve and operate and provide essential services to our shelter residents and rapidly rehouse those families. Um, our rural capacity uh, building program, uh, I mention this because um, um, some of you may be from outlying areas outside of Wichita that may be um, beneficial to you. It's a program that enhances the capacity and building of uh, rural housing development organizations like our CDCs or our CHODOs, which are um, community housing development organizations. Uh, also, local governments and Indian tribes are also eligible to uh, apply for this program. Our housing opportunities for persons with AIDS, which is, stands for HAPWA, that's a program um, dedicated for the housing needs of people that are living with HIV and uh, AIDS. And under the HAPWA program, HUD makes grants available to local communities and states um, to help benefit those low-income persons living uh, with HIV. And I also bring that up because opportunity zones are more than just about economic development. There's a quality of life issue that we need to look at and people that are suffering from mental or uh, behavioral, physical uh, ailments that can really create a barrier for people that uh, are looking for a better job or looking for to get that better education to get a better job. So that's also uh, part of opportunity zones to uplift people. Uh, Section 3, it's a provision that's been on the books with HUD uh, since 1968, and it's really been an a underutilized um, um, section that I think uh, that this administration is really trying to uh, improve upon. <clears throat> and that helps foster local economic development, neighborhood economic improvement, and individual self-sufficiency. And so through Section 3, it requires recipients of HUD financial assistance to the greatest extent feasible to uh, offer job training, employment, and contracting opportunities uh, for low-income individuals. Our public and Indian housing um, has been working with the city over the last couple of years um, 
to redevelop uh, their housing and through the RAD program, uh, the city um, has 578 units through the RAD program that they're looking to uh, redevelop. <clears throat> and this will uh, result in converting their units to uh, our project-based rental assistance, which is a Section 8 program. The first of those units are scheduled to close in December of 2019, and the remaining units will close in February and March of 2020. The, the cost of the substantial rehabilitation project is 60 million. I know on your slide earlier you had 50 million, but uh, uh, 60 million sounds better, so why don't we go with that. Um, this money is also can be leveraged um, into millions of dollars of extra economic development uh, for Wichita um, and also can be looked at by investors, um, seeing that these have been re rehabbed and for an investor to get uh, a return on their stake, they want to uh, make sure that that's a, a, vial, a viable commodity. Uh, also, Section 3 um, is a major component of uh, rehabbing um, these units. And it's not just the tenants who will get a boost, but also this is going to positively uh, boost Wichita's economy, uh, not just by the construction industry, but this filters down to uh, vendors who supply the construction industry, the hotel industry, uh, moving companies, because these people will have to be put in other units or other places while these uh, rehab is being done. <clears throat> Our Office of Lead Hazard Control and Healthy Homes uh, offers grants uh, across the country, and uh, Wichita received a uh, grant of a uh, million uh, six hundred and sixty seven thousand dollars last year that they can use to um, rehab and remediate lead uh, out of housing um, you can once again you can use uh, section three for this program and also um, by hiring people and by buying supplies needed in the community um, to remediate this lead this is also a, a boon and a benefit uh, for Wichita and also if the property is cleaned up and um, lead is uh, remediated out of these properties, that's also an uh, attractant for investors to come in and, and buy up those properties. And then our Office of Lead, um, I'm sorry, our Office of Housing Counseling uh, has grant programs uh, that provides funds to be used for housing counseling and advice um, to residents and tenants uh, to be um, positive uh, homeowners, both current and prospective, uh, and we have uh, three different uh, grants for that as well. So that kind of sums up um, HUD's grants and um, how we can be effective in making Opportunity Zones uh, successful. Thank you, Jason. Thanks. And I think there are some handouts in the back, too, that cover a lot of what Jason spoke about today. I'm trying to jump some of these down, and I gave up Next, we'll hear from our um, Federal Transit Authority, um, I said that right, yes, Administration Authority, um, Mark. Okay, bye. Good afternoon, everybody. I heard a lot about transit in the previous session, so I figure I should go next, right? <laughs> Talk about FTA. Uh, I'm Mark Bechtel, Deputy Regional Administrator with the uh, Federal Transit Administration Region 7 office in Kansas City, Missouri. And I'm proud to say I've ridden the bus for 20 years, taking the South Overland Park Express up to downtown KCMO. So if you want to give me applause on that, it's up to you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so I kind of practice what I preach. Um, we have 12 people in our office, and we're charged with working with 56 transit systems, five state DOTs, and about 30 metropolitan planning organizations in Missouri, Iowa, Nebraska, Western Illinois, and Kansas. So on behalf of USDOT Secretary Chow, it's great being here in Wichita today. I started my career a few years ago with the Wichita Sedgwick County Metropolitan Planning Department, which is now known as the Wichita Area Metropolitan Planning Organization. In other words, it's called WAMPO, and I love that acronym, WAMPO. It makes you excited, right? So actually, I've been away from Wichita many years, uh, but saying that makes me feel a little bit older. So uh, it's great to be back here in Wichita for the exciting Opportunity Zone program. Uh, got here early. Um, 
early afternoon after a beautiful drive in the Flint Hills. And when I got here, I didn't recognize the river, the river bank apartments, just fantastic. And this building right here. I have in-laws that live south of Wichita, so we always take the turnpike, what's southeast, so I need to get downtown more often when I'm here. But it's just fantastic to see what's developing here. And when I got into the building, I had to wait for two teenagers on scooters to get out of the way. They're in the driveway. <laughs> so, so you have scooters, too, here in Wichita. Uh, Federal Transit Administration is one of nine modes within the USDOT. And the USDOT is a federal agency member of the White House Opportunity and Revitalization <laughs> Council overseeing the Opportunity Zone program. Further, the USDOT is a participating federal agency with the Economic Development Work Stream, which is led by the Department of Commerce. The charge of this Economic Development Work Stream is to, quote, leverage federal grants and loans in a more integrated way to develop dilapidated properties and provide basic infrastructure and financial tools to attract private investment. I want to say that at FTA, we approve federal funding in the form of grants to our grantees, which are transit systems, state DOTs, and NPOs. Here in Wichita, our grantee and our customer is the Wichita Transit Agency, the Public Transportation Department of the City of Wichita, which operates paratransit and transit bus services in Wichita, Kansas. I brought with me a one-page uh, handout which shows the grants we've awarded to Wichita Transit in 2018-2019. Uh, it's a big crowd today. I brought, I didn't bring enough, but it's. <laughs> uh, Anyway, it's very important to note that Wichita Transit determines how your federal funds are spent, if it's for buses, if it's for bus stops, or bus facilities. So with the Opportunity Zone, you have to work with Wichita Transit to leverage those federal funding from our agency. Wichita Transit's routes, of course, goes through the Opportunity Zones. They have bus stops, et cetera, in the zones. In the sheet, I, I have. I thought I'd just go through a few things. Um, we have formula funds, which you get based on ridership, population, totals, et cetera. And in 2018, Wichita received $5 million of federal funding under formula. Your city manager said there was a decrease in ridership, pretty substantial. That number dropped to 4,500,000 in 19. In 2018, you also received some of our discretionary competitive grant awards, low no uh, funding for the buses. You, you had a slide up here with the electric bus. A lot of our systems are, are applying for those buses. You also had funding from uh, bus and bus facilities discretionary. You're competitive on that, so congratulations, you're awarded funding on that. And then you had uh, two federal highway funds uh, surface Transportation Program and CMAC in 2018, and that was about $2 million a year. So we have formula funds, we have competitive funding where you compete for it across the country against other transit systems. Then you have flex funding from federal highways, and that's where your MPO determines that federal highway funding can be flexed over to transit projects. Uh, federal Highway is not here today, so I think that's a really good use of Federal Highway funds. Okay. <laughs> uh, what's really exciting for us is when transit routes and transit stations promote private development activity. An example is substantial private development associated with the Kansas City Streetcar and the Troost and Prospect bus rapid transit lines in Kansas City. This has happened in the last five years. All of these projects receive formula, pro formula funding, excuse me, and also competitive discretionary and federal highway flex funding. So oftentimes you pool your federal funding resources for your big projects. One of those discretionary funding that Kansas City Streetcar received was the TIGER program. Now it's called the BUILD program under the current administration. And if you don't know, Wichita Transit applied for BUILD funding. And this goes to the Secretary's Office, not to FTA, but the U.S. Secretary's Office. 
and they applied for funding in Opportunity Zone Number One, I believe, the Delano Township. I think that's correct. Uh, best wishes on that application. That is decided by the Secretary's Office. If you're not successful, this is the first year you put in for that. If you're not successful, improve your application, try again. And OST, there's a guy, Howard Hill, from Brooklyn, New York, who's the guy to talk to, and he's great talking to. Uh, just to hear his dialect is really cool. Um, we have talked to Mike Tan a couple times. We've been down here to talk to him, uh, Wichita Transit. Uh, it's Mike's turn to come up and see us in Kansas City. Um, Mike has a lot of ideas for the new transit routes here in Wichita. He sent uh, Phil Nelson, the WAMPO executive director who's retiring soon. Phil sent me yesterday some concept as far as bus routes and our staff is looking at those. You have possible express buses, you have bus, bus, possible bus rapid transit, and you have some kind of like zone uh, transit, which is something that Omaha Transit did up in Nebraska. One thing our office is good at is to share best practices, arrange for peer reviews within our region of five states, and we would be happy to have peer reviews and uh, provide such assistance to Wichita. Thank you and look forward to your questions. Thanks, Stacia. Um, Mark is not lying when he says he takes the bus to work every day. Uh, Mark and I are buddies. We've been kind of hanging out together as we, we collaborate between EPA and, and Federal Transit. And I've offered to take him out for drinks after work, but he can't go because he's going to miss his bus. <laughs> uh, so we do lunch a lot uh, rather than, uh, than after work drinks. Um, again, my name is David Doyle. I'm with the Environmental Protection Agency uh, out of Kansas City, and uh, I work in what's called our Community Revitalization Program. And uh, not many people know about this program. It's, it's, it's non-regulatory, it's voluntary, and uh, what I spend most of my time doing, and I've been doing this for about 15 years now, I work with local government officials, city managers, uh, city clerks in small towns, um, uh, economic development officials, and one of the first projects I worked on uh, when I started doing this work was out in Greensburg, Kansas, uh, right after the EFI tornado uh, basically wiped Greensburg off the face of the earth. And uh, I spent uh, about 10 weeks uh, working on the long-term recovery plan for Greensburg and adding all the kind of the green uh, sustainability components into that plan, uh, which they ended up implementing most of. So if you've been through Greensburg over the last couple of years, all those uh, kind of lead platinum municipal buildings are a result uh, of a lot of the work that we did along working with the HUD and, and Economic Development Administration and the uh, and uh, USDA Rural Development. Um, I did spend a little bit of time in Wichita uh, as part of that project. Uh, there was no place to, to, to really reside in around Greensburg. So uh, for about two weeks, I had a 200 mile commute every day from a hotel on the west side of Wichita by the airport. I never want to see that hotel again. Um, <laughs> but I was eventually able to get lodging in, I think it was in Pratt, and uh, lessen the commute uh, pretty, pretty dramatically. Um, a, lot, a lot of the work I do uh, involves redeveloping uh, what are called brownfield sites. And uh, I don't know if people are familiar with brownfields, you may have heard of the term. A brownfield is basically a, a piece of property that's, that's underutilized because it's contaminated or there's a perception that it's contaminated. And uh, there are estimates of about 800,000 of these brownfield sites around the country. Uh, so there's a lot of work to be done uh, by EPA and our state counterparts to uh, provide resources to communities to basically get these sites assessed from an environmental standpoint, and then if there is contamination, get them cleaned up. So I work a lot with local government to do that kind of work. Uh, we have resources that can, uh, can, that can do that. Uh, and uh, I, hopefully, I'm like Mark, I didn't make enough copies of this fact sheet that uh, Charlie Foley walked around a little while ago. but. Uh, this list, and this is hot off the presses, we just developed this, and it's called our Land Revitalization Resources from EPA. 
And uh, let me kind of walk through a couple of these. I'm not going to go through this fact sheet uh, in its entirety because it would take too much time. But uh, some of the key resources that EPA has available, uh, one is through our, what's called our Brownfield Grants Program. And these are competitive grants uh, that offer uh, awardees uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars in some cases to uh, do environmental assessments on brownfield sites, uh, to do environmental cleanup. Uh, there's some planning uh, technical assistance that's part of these, uh, these grants along with developing job training for uh, uh, communities that are being impacted by, by brownfields. Um, Moving down the page here, uh, targeted brownfield assessments. This is a first come, first serve uh, resource that's really underutilized in our agency. This is an EPA contractor that's kind of on standby. And when a community uh, asks or has a need to do an environmental assessment, uh, either a phase one, which is mostly kind of a record search, and a phase two, which involves more uh, kind of intrusive uh, monitoring, uh, we have contractors uh, at the ready it's a two-page application, and we can have a contractor doing a phase one, phase two uh, at a site within a matter of a couple of months. We're changing contracts right now, so that may not be true right now, but uh, hopefully when that contract's in place sometime next month, we'll be back uh, providing this, this resource. And again, it's first come, first serve. Uh, the other thing I'll mention from an EPA resource standpoint is what's called our technical assistance to brownfields communities. This is a third party uh, in, in the case of Kansas and this region of the country, it's offered by Kansas State University. We provide grant money to them to act as a third party. You don't have to talk to EPA, uh, but you can go to Kansas State, and uh, they provide a whole host of resources. Um, that can help you write an application for an EPA grant. They can uh, develop an inventory of, of brownfield sites uh, within a community and uh, provide training on, on what a brownfield is and how to do rec redevelopment uh, um, of those sites. So that's our, our fact sheet. If you didn't get one, I have an electronic version. I can email it to you that has live links to each of these, uh, these, uh, these resources. So afterwards, please come up to me, give me a business card or your, your email address, and, and I will uh, put you on our, our list to, to get this fact sheet. I also send out a blast list of resources from EPA that I see from our headquarters. And if you want to get on, on my list, and please, it's not going to be junk email or anything, once every month or so, I'll see a resource and I'll send out. I've got about 200 email addresses uh, on my list, and uh, I'd be happy to add to that list, too. Uh, last thing I'll mention is uh, I did a little research as part of the preparation for this, uh, for this event, and I was asked to look for where, where are EPA uh, resources being uh, uh, offered historically in, in Wichita. And uh, you guys don't get much, if anything, <laughs> from EPA historically from a, from a redevelopment, uh, Brownfields redevelopment standpoint. The, the only resource I saw, uh, and I had to go to the state KDHE, Kansas Department of Health and Environment, who we partner with a lot in, in doing this type of work, uh, out of 164 uh, phase one, phase twos that the state provides using EPA resources, over the last five years there are four of them in Wichita. That's a little mind-boggling, considering you're the largest city in the, in the state, only getting four of that, of that resource. And so it's something that I think uh, maybe local government, other officials may begin to look at from an EPA resource standpoint. Again, we partner with KDHE a lot, so you can talk to KDHE if you don't like to talk to EPA. And um, that's, uh, that's about all I got. So I'll be happy to take questions after we're done with the rest of the panel. Thanks. And next, we're going to hear from Wayne Bell. He is the district director for the um, Small Business Administration. And I'm going to try to help here get your presentation up. Yeah. I don't know. Do I save it? <laughs> oh, there we go. Thank you, Stacia. And good afternoon. I want, want to acknowledge a few members of the SBA team before I get started. Uh, our regional administrator, Tom Salisbury, he's with us today from Kansas City. Also regional advocate, Adrienne Foster, she's also here from Kansas City, and many of you know Adrienne. Uh, she worked at one time in the Wichita area as, uh, I believe, uh, president of the Hispanic Chamber as well as uh, within the Wichita Chamber? No, it's the Hispanic Chamber. 
Hispanic Chamber. All right. Also, we have Michael Almack in the room. He's a member of our team here in Wichita, economic development specialist. So I want to just very briefly walk you through a few resources that are available to investors, uh, investors within small business, and certainly to the small business community. One area that particularly gets overlooked, and I think this uh, whole discussion of opportunity zones is a great, great segue uh, for those businesses to think about government contracting because there's actually some overlap between the opportunity zones locally and one of our most uh, prominent government contracting programs, which is the Hub Zone program. All right, so you see this map here. By our count, there are 37 Hub Zone areas uh, in our immediate uh, territory around Wichita. Uh, there were nine Opportunity Zone areas identified. And then what you see there in pink, or I guess kind of a near, near pink, <laughs> uh, you see that fuchsia, that's right, an overlap there of those areas that would be the Opportunity Zones as well as the Hub Zones. So again, for those investors, uh, those uh, business owners that or, or looking to perhaps relocate their businesses, or for those entrepreneurs that might be looking at where to get started and where to establish their place of business, I, I'd like to just keep this on your radar. So what a hub zone is, it's an acronym. It stands for Historically Underutilized Business Zones. Again, it's a federal contracting uh, program that's available to small businesses. Uh, the requirements are that the small business has to employ at least 35% of its workforce from a hub zone. And it doesn't have to be in one particular hub zone, it just has to be that 35% of those employees, again, reside in a place that by census data is a hub zone area. And again, the business has to be located in a hub zone. Uh, it's huge, and I'll just give you, put it in perspective, just Year to date, uh, in terms of our, our federal year, which starts October 1st and runs through September 30th, year to date, $8.4 million for Kansas have been awarded to companies that are located in hub zones. So this is a tremendous opportunity for business owners and perhaps as you look to scale or grow your business, consider government contracting and then particularly consider hub zones within the Opportunity Zones. All right, I uh, wanted to highlight as we think about capital for business owners and our, and our Opportunity Zones, there's a particular program that today is really underutilized in this area, and it's the Community Advantage Loan Program. These loans are specifically intended for underserved communities which includes our Opportunity Zones, and the loan amounts go up to $250,000. Uh, the terms range anywhere from 10 to 25 years, depending on whether or not there's property involved. And I'd like to point out, these are loans that are accessed through mission-focused lenders. And so we have one of our lending partners in the room today, and that is the South Central Kansas Economic Development District, or SCAD, uh, their president, uh, Steve Wilkerson is here uh, in the room today. Another option as you're thinking about access to capital when you think about SBA programming is our microloan program. Again, this is a program that's available to uh, business owners, entrepreneurs uh, that may reside in the opportunity zones. They may also be uh, underserved in general one of the criteria uh, within the microloan program is uh, if the potential borrower has been denied credit uh, through other sources, this is kind of our last option within the SBA in terms of capital that may be accessed. So again, uh, the microloan program, great avenue. Uh, the terms of these loans go out to six years. Uh, or up to six years, it doesn't have to uh, be that long. And again, this may be a starting point 
for some uh, entrepreneurs or business owners that are looking to access capital, uh, something else to consider. One of the other advantages of that particular program, uh, there is the technical assistance that may be accessed also uh, through this particular program. Wanted to highlight the 504 loan program. So again, for the established businesses in the room that may be looking to expand, this is a great program. The SBA component of the deal can go up to $5 million, all right? There's a requirement that for every $75,000 in capital from the SBA under this program, that at least one job be created. And that may be a two part-timers uh, that, that equal the equivalent of one full-time position. One interesting thing to note is within the opportunity zones, we were just talking about this, that that actually, that, that ceiling goes up to $85,000 for those entities that are within the opportunity zone. So uh, again, something else to consider. Uh, right now, the rate on our 504 program is hovering around 4%. Great program, and I would encourage you all, again, out of, uh, the, out of the lenders in the room, SCAD is a participant. They're a certified development company, and they participate in the 504 loan program. And so if you want more information, I encourage you to uh, talk to Steve Wilker Wilkerson uh, at the break. All right, our 7A loan program, again, just something to be aware of. This is our most popular loan avenue uh, for potential businesses or business owners that are established in anything from property to equipment, inventory, on and on, can be you know, uh, funded using the uh, 7A program. Uh, it's a great program if there's property involved. Uh, the terms can go all the way out again to 25 years. Uh, the interest rate on this kind of varies. Uh, we go a few percentage points above what uh, the, the LIBOR rate is or what you would, you know, be able to get uh, conventionally. Uh, but it's a good avenue and our most popular avenue. Our loan guarantees associated with the, this particular program range anywhere from 50% to as high as 90% in terms of that guarantee. So it's a good program to consider. Uh, for businesses within the opportunity zones that may be considering exporting, uh, the loan guarantees with our export-related loans go out to 90%. So again, this is a good avenue. And again, I uh, wanted to just raise awareness of these options. Uh, this final slide here kind of shows from our current activity, I mentioned that the, the hub zone contracts awarded uh, statewide, uh, and this was actually through July 31st, were $8.4 million. From my perspective, what I see in our area, in our district, we do not do, or businesses in this area do not participate enough in government contracting. It's a tremendous, tremendous opportunity when you think about uh, underserved businesses in general. Uh, this is a great, great avenue to grow. And I see there are business owners in the room uh, that have utilized government contracting to springboard their companies certainly something that as we think about opportunity zones that we need to really keep on the radar. So I have in the back of the room, I've got a number of folders that uh, we didn't get handed out, but would love for you all to take one of our folders. And uh, that's uh, pretty much all I have at this time. Again, I want to thank you all. Uh, Jason, more, I want to thank you for reaching out to us so that uh, we could participate here today. And also I want to thank Scott with the city of Wichita. And again, I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you, Scott. Thank you. <clears throat> I see that I'm already out of time. Thank you, man. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll go quickly. I've got like you know 15 minutes of information that my staff put together. I'll try to get through in just a couple of minutes. But uh, Jeff Cars and I'm a Wichita boy. Actually, I went to uh, East High School, went to Wichita State, and uh, my entire family lives here. So I'm excited about this opportunity. No pun intended. 
Um, I work at HHS. I'm the regional director for Region 7, which is Kansas, Nebraska, Missouri, Iowa. I work and I'm housed in downtown Kansas City, uh, but we're excited about this program. And as you know, or maybe you don't know, this is a program that uh, the, uh, the President Trump and his administration pushed heavily, especially uh, Mr. Carson over at HUD, who's really the point guard. But my boss, Mr. Azar, at HHS serves on the coordinating council as well. So what I want to do very quickly is just kind of walk through how HHS is approaching this opportunity. Uh, we're still, you know, working on it. There, we haven't got a final list of grants that are going to have preference points and whatnot. Uh, but I do have a couple of them that I'll mention at the end of my very quick presentation. Basically, the investments that HHS is most interested in, uh, for obvious reasons, because of our portfolio, our grocery stores, restaurants, health clinics, and housing. Uh, the White House Strategy for Opportunity Zones assigns HHS support roles for three of the five goals. They're called work streams. And I want to mention just what those three work streams are for HHS. First is economic development, which makes obviously sense. Roughly 90% of the federal funding in Kansas from HUD goes to state government. I should say that every year, $20 billion flows into Region 7 from HHS. HHS hands out more money than every other federal agency combined. We are a fourth of the federal budget. A lot of that is CMS, which is Medicare and Medicaid. But about $5 billion, $6 billion of that $20 billion flows into Kansas every year. But as I said, 90% of that really goes to the governor, and then the governor uh, disseminates it out. But there's a lot of one-on-one uh, -on -one grants uh, that are come out as well. Uh, and last year, Wichita received over, or last two years, Wichita received over $63 million just in the last two years in these type of grants. The second work stream I want to talk about briefly is safe neighborhoods. Uh, and there's three ways that we contribute to this. The first is to combat drug addiction and the opioid crisis and reduce crimes. Obviously, the opioid crisis, uh, I can't ever speak uh, or I'd be in trouble with my boss if I don't talk about the opioid crisis. That's the top priority of HHS and Secretary Azar, one of the top priorities um, of the Trump administration. And I had a great meeting this morning with the mayor uh, discussing that issue along with opportunity zones. Number two is to, uh, the, the number two area is to assist communities addressing environmental contamination, where we work with EPA as well. Uh, we have our own agency called uh, Agency for Toxic Substance and Disease <laughs> Registry, and three things where we've done significant work in Kansas in this area is lowering the blood levels, uh, lowering the blood lead levels in children. Uh, which is an issue in this region, especially in Missouri, but also in Kansas, ensuring safe drinking water for everyone and making sure that old industrial sites are free of hazardous sites. And uh, the gentleman from EPA spoke to that a little bit earlier. And then the third is to help communities expand inmate rehabilitation programs to improve reentry to society. A lot of this is obviously done at DOG, DOJ through the Bureau of, of uh, Prisons, but we work hand in hand with them as well uh, for obvious reasons. Uh, and then last but not least, education workforce development is our last third workstation that we work on. Um, at last count, the council coordinating opportunity zones, I understand, have, have recognized uh, or have set aside about 160 programs that could be leveraged in conjunction with opportunity zones. Uh, this can be done, this is what we're doing at least at HHS, and it's probably going to be similarly done at the other 11 cabinet agencies. There's 12 cabinet agencies that are working on this council. Grant preference points, that's something we'll be doing at HHS uh, that are in an opportunity zone. Less stringent loan qualifications, reduced fees, and modified eligibility criteria to try to make these grants more competitive to help out this effort with opportunity zones. Um, as I said earlier, the, uh, the Coordinated Council is still working on a comprehensive list. If you're interested in more details and what we're looking at at HHS beyond what I present to you this today, come and grab me afterwards. Give me your business card. And I'll, I'll make sure that I have my staff email you what we have. But it's, it's, it's still, frankly, a work in project. Uh, we're working process. So one of the big ones that we're doing is community economic development grants. It's administrated by the Administration for Children and Families. Um, there'll be a total of $13 million each year available for these type of grants. They can range from anywhere from $100,000 to $800,000. Um, other grants that we have, 
Uh, and again, I've got like three pages of these that are still being uh, put together, but I'm happy to email, have my staff email this out to you. But in addition to the community economic development grants are child care grants, child support collection program grants, grants for construction of new community health centers or expansion of existing clinics, and last, youth sports projects to encourage regular physical activity and to improve physical activity and nutrition by increasing sports participation. All of these make sense if you think about what HHS does. So like I said, I'm happy to answer questions or, or really come up to me afterwards if you want me to send you some more details. Give me your business card, your email address, and I'll make sure the staff gets this information to you. All right, thank you very much. into the uh, round table, again, semi round table discussion, and take questions for these federal representatives. Charles, I'm sorry for making you sit earlier. <laughs> I appreciate that. You made this 85 year old guy stand around this long and say something. That's all right. My name is Charles Mack. I'm the great grandson of David Mack, wounded in the Battle of Petersburg, fighting for the Union Army. I'm the grandson of Abraham Mack, wounded going up San Juan Hill. My oldest uncle was gassed in the trenches in World War I and came home and died at 29. So I'm lucky I'm here. Or maybe you're lucky I'm here. I'm going to be your cheerleader. Everybody keeps telling me I'm 20 years ahead of my time. I don't have 20 years left, I don't think, to be ahead of my time. So I want you to be ahead of my time. The first panel, everybody mentioned affordable housing. About the second year I opened my business as an architect, I was convinced by somebody that the way you build housing is in a factory. Well, I built this house. I was on a chamber board of directors and vice president. And the chamber president lived across the river. And I came walking in the office for a meeting one day and he said, what are you dreaming about? I said, I created what you call the first affordable house. He said, where? I said, oh, actually across the river from you. He said, my wife said, honey, they're building a house across the river. Well, we got time to go and see it. When I came home yesterday, he said, Honey, they built the house across the river. The chamber opened that house up, 5,000 people went through it one day. We opened the factory, had six partners. Those six partners decided they didn't need me anymore and tried to put me out of my company. Well, they ended up closing down, that didn't work. But about 20 years later, with people really coming to me from all over the country, my two best friends, the Jackson Brothers from Jackson Morrison where I started a company called JM Limited and Maxie Manufacturing. JM Limited was our development company to go along with Maxie Manufacturing. Well, we had almost 200 people working for us. One day we picked 50 women off the welfare from the city of Wichita. Started them to work. We gave them 11 and a half dollars an hour. This is the mid-90s. Let them have the uh, training work. We provide them with uniforms because we didn't want them coming to work embarrassed. So we gave them uniforms. We provide them with 100% health care, no deductible, in the mid 90s. We won all kinds of awards, national awards. We had mayors, city managers. We had two groups of people coming from Russia. Uh, the system can build almost anything you can live in. Almost everything you guys talked about, you can build with that system. I submitted, when this program first started, I submitted a proposal to the governor's office back in March. I have yet to even get an acknowledgement that I sent it. Because I work all over the country, I have offices in Dallas and Atlanta. We work from the West Coast to the East Coast. 
I've been monitoring opportunity zones everywhere. I really hope Wichita takes the lead in what can be done nationwide. Because all the things that you guys have to offer, I think if you figure out how we can come together, we can get this done. And I challenge you to get this done. I'd like you to look at the proposal that we submitted to the governor's office to start a factory up by 21st Street on the land that my great grandpa once owned. In fact, the land that City Hall is on, my great grandpa owned. All I'm trying to tell you is, this has been my town all my life. I don't like to go to other towns and see all these other towns how to do it. I don't like that. But what my generation has done has educated some of the greatest young people in this country. You know where they all are? They're all in LA. They're all in Atlanta. They're all in DC. They're all in New York City. My nephew, born here, is a lawyer for the National Football League. In, in New York City, I have three daughters. Both of them have master's degrees in architecture. One runs the Texas region, the other runs the Atlanta East Coast region. My middle daughter, the smartest of all, is getting her PhD and she's a hospital administrator in California. But it's not just my family, it's all the generation below me. This is what Wichita has done. My black clients with money don't get loans in this town. Jackson Mortuary, when I first did Jackson Mortuary on 13th Street, I looked at Mr. Jackson and I said, Mr. Jackson, have you met your bank home? He looked up at me and said, don't you know they don't want this money? I said, what? I talked to him and he went to the Fort National Bank. Three days later, we went back to the loan officer and left, telling Mr. Jackson he refused his loan. I said, how did you refuse his loan? Well, he doesn't have a done branch tree rate. The only way you get a done branch tree rate is you have to borrow money and pay it back. But if you can't borrow, how the hell are you going to pay it back? Mr. Jackson, who never smiled, and I knew I was getting ready to get killed, but he treated me like one of his twin sons. And he says, fine. We went down to the bank floor. We walked across the bank floor and went up to the teller. And he said, hi, Mr. Jackson. And he said, I want all of my money out of here in cash. We walked out of that bank with a grocery sack. I never did know how much cash was in that bag. But he didn't need the money to build the building. But if Jackson Mortuary couldn't build it, he couldn't borrow any money then. The rest of us were short of trouble. Nothing has changed. When we have a pizza franchise in Atlanta, five pizza units, and the largest delivery in the state of Georgia, we come back to Wichita, couldn't borrow that with a pizza franchise. Nothing has changed. Yeah, and Charles is, um as most of us who know Charles, you are the huge I, champion I, I, I of Wichita. I, I'm going to end You're going to get them. to your question? Okay. I'm going to end with them. But I have a real challenge to make with all my fellow people. Every last one of you know that the Mississippi River is all flood, don't you? Don't you? You all know that. Well, I'm going to give you an idea that I'd like you fellow people to participate in. I want you to start something called the Kansas Aqueduct System. You know what that is? I want you to put a pump on the Mississippi River at I-70. And I want you to run down the middle of I-70 all the way to Kansas City and pass the line all the way across Kansas. And run it all the way to California. I want you to come down to I-35 and I-40 and I-20 and I-10 and go all the way to the West Coast. Create retention ponds and detention ponds all along the way so that if there was a drought in Nebraska, or if there was a drought in Western Kansas, you'd have water available. You know that the Mississippi, all you got to do is reduce the level of it along the way, build it out of plastic pipe, and we got plenty of ways we can redo it up. If you look at a map of this country, look at a map of where the oil and gas lines are, you'd be scared to walk. But if we can transfer water, we can save a whole lot of people. I'm 20 years ahead of my time. What the hell are you going to catch up? Thank you.
party signs in the giant postal car. Thank you all for coming. This is a technical question. I'm pretty sure I'm going to answer them all the The Opportunity Zone program uh, is a tax provision. It says the Internal Revenue Code to allow people to defer taxes in order to conduct the zone. None of your programs require access to a fund, correct? If you're in the zone, it's a real estate issue or a location issue, and it doesn't require participation to an opportunity zone fund in order to take advantage of your programs in the fund, in the zone, right? Correct. Thank you. Thank you. And probably in one area we did overlook, I think, in all of this is focusing on the, on the representation with those tax deferrals, but maybe we can put something like this together, Harvey, and you can come back and, and school us on that, be part of our round table. Any other questions for our federal partners? I, I had one quick question. For those, um, I know Charlie touched on this a little bit, but for those small businesses, minority-owned businesses um, that have some capital or think that they um, have the customer or the opportunity um, to get into the market. Is there a one-stop shop area of resources that they can go to or you would recommend or, um, I mean, I myself was even surprised at the vast array of resources in these departments, um, opportunities, grants, um, and incentives. Great, uh, great question. So you know, there really isn't a one-stop shop, but uh, the easy answer, I guess, for me would be to encourage anyone to contact a local SBA office. What we're going to do and what SBA is really charged with doing is getting our entrepreneurs and our business owners to the right resources. Uh, and certainly, if those resources include ours, we're going to help step along the way. We've got partners that provide technical assistance. Again, we help with access to capital. We'll help those entrepreneurs that want to pursue government contracting to navigate that. We do that in partnership with a number of our partners uh, who are in the room. So, if nothing else, sba.gov, that gets you to our website. If you want to come visit with us, we're right here in downtown Wichita in the Broadway Center. Uh, I'd be happy to meet with anyone. We, we do a lot of outreach. A big, big aspect of what we do has to do with raising awareness of our programs, raising awareness of the other partners that we work with so that we can help entrepreneurs and business owners that want to go about doing it to do it in an informed fashion. And then one thing I will also leave with you is that there is risk Inherently, there, you know, going into business is risky. However, we want to help individuals do that in a very informed fashion so that you make great choices and educated decisions as you move forward. Uh, so, love to visit with any group and any partners that want to continue to just raise awareness of resources to get people connected to the right resources. I, I will say that uh, the White House and HUD are working uh, on a website called OpportunityZones.gov and that should be out uh, hopefully sometime in September. Now we'll have a wealth of information on Opportunity Zones and whether it's located in the That's perfect. Okay. We got two more things we want to get done today and we want to move into our focus discussion on the program alignments and impacts to Opportunity Zones. And um, I would invite back up to the front um, some of our um, local representatives, state and city, and certainly would love some um, federal representatives as well if we wanted to. No, we're not going to stay up here. Okay, that's fine. <laughs>
Okay, did we have want to have any other um, representatives come up? Well, we want to talk a little bit about program alignment, um, what we can do, and um, the impacts in the opportunity zones. Maybe we start with the local side, um, Greater Wichita Partnership. Do you have any thoughts or concluding remarks in terms of the program alignment, alignments and the impacts in the opportunity zones? Yeah, I think so. I mean, what we talked about too is it's a, there's a lot of moving parts and there's a lot of partners and let's take advantage of this. And the one I just spoke, I mean, you're, you're in the head and you said, you know, we've got to get, we have an opportunity to do this right. And, but at the same time, I think one of the things that Wichita hasn't done very well is new capital coming into our communities from outside. When you look at our, when you look at other cities that we're in competition with, and if, if you don't think we're in competition, then you need to um, really pay attention. But you know, the Oklahoma cities, the Kansas cities, we're losing talent to. Uh, we know that we know that our talent's going to Fort Worth and Dallas. We know that we're losing talent. Um, so we, we've, we've got to do things better than we have in the past. And, and in order to do that, we've got to bring in new capital from outside. And so number one, we've got to, people have to know about us. They have to know about the opportunities here. And we've got to be willing to, to do our more, so to speak. And so um, I think that's step one. And, and that's some of the, where we're focused, is, is really making sure that people are aware but then it's, it's making sure people are locally here are informed. Um, and, and that goes to another level that, that somebody asks. If I'm a business owner, how do I know about these programs? You know, if I'm not at a forum like this today or I'm able to do that, most of those individuals are not thinking about this. They're, they're running their business from day to day. So it's, it's our charge as officials, as economic development entities and, and other uh, nonprofit organizations to support those and to make sure that the, the, the Harvey Sorensons and the the, uh, the accountants and so forth are, are well versed and can help their clients um, with a wealth of information. So I learned a lot just from the federal partners that were here. There were programs that, that I wasn't aware of. This is my job, right? It's my job to know. So so there's a lot of overlap, and I think um, each one of us has to step up in, in our individual roles and really make a concerted effort. You know, when, when you talk about this, this, this federal program, there are really the, the benefits to the business owner that I think get less talked about. I mean, the real estate ploy or the real estate uh, pieces, I think, are pretty easily to define because, you know, you get the tax breaks and you can, you can invest in, in real estate in these, um, these areas and, 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 and not have the, the tax implications. But, but I think the real benefit to the neighborhoods, and one of the things is, is how, do we, how do we help these small businesses that can make incremental impacts um, to a lot of these areas? And so that's what we're going to be focused on, uh, partnering with, with obviously the government, locally, and the state. Um, we have great relationships with, with all of those folks. And so um, if you're in the room today, tell somebody else. I mean, that's the best thing you can do, is make sure that people are informed. All of us, I think, would drop anything to, to have a conversation. Um, we give lots of presentations to different smaller groups. Um, I've met with bankers. I've given, been part of uh, presentations to account speakers. Um, but even if you have um, your networking group, uh, make sure that they know about this and how we can layer some of these, these programs together. Thanks. Um, Patty Gaughan, I'll try to one of the things that the state is doing is really going to facilitate a lot of communication with there being 74 census tracts across 35 counties across the state. We spent a lot of time talking 
to a lot of folks in a whole wide variety of locations. One of the things that we are doing is with some assistance from the Kauffman Foundation, we're launching by the end of September a website that is going to highlight all 35 counties and the census tracts that will be within those counties. This will include Wichita. We're working directly with each community so that they can update and put community information. We're going to have very similar information in terms of maps, economic data. Wichita, the Greater Wichita Partnership, you guys, you have no idea how far ahead of the game Wichita is in talking about opportunities on you know, the local level, but at the national level. Uh, you can look at other cities, and you guys have a terrific partner here. They're doing tremendous work. At the state level, what we're going to try to do is rise all the boats together, bring up the tide with this website to allow communities to talk about who they are. They're also going to be talking about um, where the opportunity zones are located and whether or not they have projects in the works or potential projects. What do they need? They'd like a grocery store. They'd like to uh, rehab their downtown area as a way for folks outside of the state and within their own communities to learn more about what's going on. It's also really clear that we have a lot of work to do just on basic education with regards to opportunity zones. If you go to www.kansascommerce.gov, there's a whole section called Federal Opportunity Zones just for basic education. What are they? How do they come into being? And what are some of the basic sort of uh, playing mechanisms that folks who want to invest there's a whole slide to on the business side with regards to um, investing in a bond and funds and investing in a project. So other recommendation is educate yourself on what opportunity zone is, what opportunity zone fund, and actually how they work. Thanks. Uh, for me, in regards to alignment, uh, I'm a visual person, so Wayne Bell's presentation really kind of hit home. Uh, what we should be doing, and I'm glad we still have state partners who are elected in, in the room. So, from our state programs that we have, and just throwing one out there on the Rural Opportunity Zone, how can we align all of those programs in these specific neighborhood areas? And Wayne's map kind of showed where those sub zones are as opposed to our opportunity zones. How can we get all of that aligned and to make the greatest impact in these areas? So, the federal programs we heard about today, if there's any other state incentives. City incentives, our council priorities have shifted a little bit into some of these areas as well. So, aligning all of those uh, in our opportunity zones, specifically in our neighborhoods, I think is going to be key to success and definitely have an involvement from uh, investors and developers and all that to see what else can make it attractive for investment. And as you guys were talking, I was trying to put up some. Uh, thoughts in terms of what can we do, what are some things that we know will be successful. I would love to hear from any of you here today of your thoughts. Um, this is intended to be kind of um, part one of many parts of initiatives that, that the state and uh, local governments have for Kansas to try to continue to do more than just talk and educate, but also make some of this happen. Um, where we need to make it happen in the opportunity zones. We know it's going to take, obviously, our partners at the federal level and the resources that they can provide, as well as the state resources and assistance. Um, but really, most importantly, um, investors, um, business people, community representatives to become um, involved. And are, are there any other ideas or thoughts in terms of um, how we might be successful or what we need to do to move forward and to take advantage of these opportunity zone um, initiatives. Bernard? How you doing? My name is Bernard Holes. Um, it's making things a little more accessible. Look at what you're saying, owning your, to me your own. We have enough I see a multi, I see millionaires in the city of Wichita. We do not have access to opportunity funds. You know, it's okay to have the zone set up and set up opportunity funds. <clears throat> but how did you tap into these opportunity funds? 
there's the opportunity to fund that these millionaires here in Wichita can create to help build and rebuild our own communities. That's basically a statement. Um, and how do we apply to how we fund? The state money, grant money, and all that's good. Um, Jason is doing his shopping nationally. Nationally, it's probably 103 opportunity funds, and they're growing. Um, but sometimes we have to step out of the box, our local people, to reinvest in the communities in which they grew up in. I'm not from here, but I give a lot of my investment in these areas. I'm a developer, I'm a general contractor, I own a restaurant. So I support the community which I don't even live in to help it grow, to offer jobs and opportunities for people. Some of the millionaires, the billionaires in Wichita step up and invest in opportunity funds to take advantage of the tax implications. Do not have to pay capital gains on that money. And then we reinvest back in our community to help build our stronger communities and create better jobs. That's my comment. You know, one of the comments that came from the audience that I um, thought was crucial and I want to put on there is um, community involvement and feedback. Um, I know being at WSU and I assist with the Innovation Campus a lot of times and I'm legal counsel, um, I see things from the perspective of what can be successful, what can we do legally, uh, where do we have the money to do it? And sometimes it is difficult to um, take, take yourself out of that and, and ask yourself and involve the community what is needed here, what will be successful here, what do they want here? And um, I know that that's very important in our development initiatives. Um, and certainly I was happy to see we had community um, representatives here with that in mind and partnering with these groups I think is very important because um, uh, I know in, in talking to some local developers about um, initiatives around the university and these opportunity zones, um, you can have the money to build it and you can have the contractors and you can build it but they still need to come and um, getting that community investment involvement and buy-in at the beginning of it and being a part of that will ensure its success long-term as well. Um, so community involvement and feedback, I think, is also um, very crucial. Another thing that I did hear um, uh, talk about, and we talk a lot about infusing the local economy and community in these areas, which is a, a critical, but we also recognize that we have to draw from national interest, maybe it's financial interest or development or money um, to come into our communities to invest. Um, that's another way to grow. Some people um, certainly would call that competition, but I think we have to also understand that there is only so much we can do, and if we want to really fully capitalize on the growth opportunities in these zones, um, we want to be encouraging and embracing in outside um, interest and in investors. So I'll put that down. Anything else? I think one of the things that has also been very apparent is people need examples of what is working. So if you read the Wichita Business Journal this morning and a small article about physical fireworks, that's a good example of you know your kind of first opportunities on business. Even nationally, Accelerator America, if you go to the Commerce website, there's a whole list of different investment opportunities in terms of folks that are doing lots of um, different kinds of opportunity zone investment. So I think getting examples and understanding how different communities have done things also really sparks a lot of great conversation. I know Jason, I think your team brought a two-page or a double-sided sheet today. It should be, I think, floating around here somewhere. They gave lots of really good examples of what is happening in opportunity zones in other parts of the nation. And again, being able to look at those, to spark some ideas, to spark some conversation, Maybe do a little bit of homework that will move the conversation along as well. Great point. Yes. Uh, and I think I can speak 
loud enough without going to the mic, but some type of a timeline might be helpful as well. So that gives the community an opportunity to know what are some of the next steps and when they need to be involved. So I hear 10 years that this program will be going on. So a timeline would be good. So if we're looking for that fellow tomorrow, that's one timeline that we hit and we know that that part is coming. And so what are the next steps? I think that's a great point and I threw in just because I had thought of that earlier too um, it's going to go fast 10 years is not very long unless we are successful in getting it extended um, that's it and we had to get up very fast and I think everybody's very quickly trying to gather as much information get out as much information um, but these partnerships and these connections and these frankly decisions um, have to be made very quickly so we can take full advantage of these Any other thoughts? Yes. I'm Sheila Ramsey, and I'm with the Realtors of South Central Kansas. And one of the services we have that hasn't really been touched on is uh, a site called kscommercialre.com, which is basically a listing service of commercial properties. And um, if you search on there, there's actually a checkbox for opportunity zone properties. So um, I'm not sure how many are on there now. We have about 1,200 properties in total, and I'm not sure how many call them an opportunity zone, but that's a good way to identify actual properties that are currently listed for sale. So. That's perfect. Yes. Yes. Hi. I would just say, um, there, in regards to the timeline, an investor only has right now until December 31st of this year to invest in the opportunity zone, um, and so they're looking at maybe extending that, but for those the gentleman that was asking earlier, hey, to get investors from the Wichita community, well, they only have until December 31st. That's, that's partially right. That, to take advantage of the full step of the basis, that would be right. to the 15%. Yes. You have until uh, December 31st, 2026. It, it reduces, you it, have 10%. Right, yes. but to get the full effect. You can actually invest after that to take advantage. Most, most of the real estate community that we're talking to, the step of the basis is, a, is an added bonus. But it's not the, the real carrot. The real carrot is at the end of uh, holding your asset for 10 years, and you know, you, you will pay no capital gains on that if you, if you if divest that, that asset after that. So from a real estate play, developers who are looking to buy and hold an asset more than 10 years, that's the real carrot. And because when and if you sell that, that asset, you, you pay no capital gains tax on that. So, uh, but yes, to your point, the, the timeline is ticking, and so a lot of the opportunity funds that have been created locally, and the uh, gentleman spoke, there are millions that have been already created in our own community. But at the end of the day, this program is not going to make a bad real estate investment a good one. It, it just it won't. The, the, the risk and reward and return on investment is still going to be calculated and measured just like they would on any other project they go into. And although the 10% is, is good, most of the time that's not the incentive that's needed to, to make a, a project. For example, historic tax credits, I mean, just as a comparison, you can get 20%, 25% credit on some of these, these projects and a lot of downtown projects have taken advantage of that. So compare that, that's a massive incentive in a lot of these projects where uh, capital is needed to make to make the, the project go from a cash flow standpoint. So I just want to make that, that one thing clear. But yeah, uh, the fact that it's taken the, the, the federal government almost two years or a year and a half, it's been over 18 months before we finally got all the regulations and, and there are still more questions and some of those are still coming, we think there's the possibility that some of those dates could be adjusted or extended because we haven't even had uh, the full time period to take advantage of what they initially intended. So. I think what I add is one of the benefits of this day was I think it's the first time in my 20 plus years of, of government to have as many federal partners, state partners, and city partners visit face to face to say we're here to work on a, an issue. And what I would say is, as much as we're focused on Opportunity Zones here today, Opportunity Zone is one of a number of programs we've got to utilize together to leverage to 
see the real change in significant input and increasing the economic values to some of our areas of the city. So it's just because you have an opportunity zone for whether it be 10 years or whatever, how to leverage that with, I think I'm going to hold the, at least say four grants from EPA over the last so many years. Okay, so we're going to get five. <laughs> the next one we're going to get, right? But, but see, the value is now I have a direct connection to an EPA contact or to a HUD contact. <coughs> the council member picks the phone and says, hey, you said we could do this, HHS. How does that work? Remember, we talked about that in the back. The opportunity we had today to network, and then somewhat the goal is how we hold each other accountable to say, I was there, we had that discussion. We all said we're in this together. Now it's time to come together. I think a, a great example is the question we have from the attorney to the federal people is, is this the right way I'm interpreting that? Operating zone, as well as a number of other state, local, federal uh, uh, challenges are, can we explain this? Can we walk somebody through, even who's a sophisticated developer or a first time small business owner, to walk through the steps? Do we have the time to hold their hand? It's not gonna be an overnight, here's your grant, or here's your thing, is we're in it for the long haul. And that just can't be on elected officials or local officials, it's gotta be for the whole community come to get together and say, we'll walk you through that process the whole way. So it's, it's a long-term commitment, not just, you gotta get, build your thing in the next 18 months to get the benefit, it's, are you invested in Wichita to see the changes we wanna have? Maybe not for your generation, I think that's perfect. In fact, I'll take those as my closing remarks. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> any other thoughts? Well, I just wanted to thank everyone for sticking around. It, it was a long couple of three hours there with a lot of information. And absolutely thank everybody here at the round table and the presenters. And I hope everyone sticks around and shakes some hands and meets some people.